My name is Michael Washburn. I'm the interim director of public programs here at the Graduate Center. And I'd like to welcome you to what promises to be an illuminating discussion this evening. It's uh, this semester's first keynote event in the Graduate Center's year-long exploration of the creative economy. As many of you likely know, the Graduate Center is a school of arts and sciences, a center for applied and theoretical research, and a platform for performance, conversation, and public debate. As a community of students and scholars committed to the idea that learning is a public good, we regularly offer public programs featuring eminent thinkers, cultural leaders, and distinguished artists addressing some of today's most pressing issues. To that end, we've been delighted to present Cultural Capital, the promise and price of New York's creative economy, which has been an institution-wide public programming initiative that's been exploring the city's creative and knowledge-based industries through an array of conversations, panel discussions, screens, and performances. From music and publishing to arts organizations and tech startups, New York has long been vital to the creation and consolidation of the creative economy. And throughout this academic year, we've been exploring these fields and many others. But tonight, which is midway through the second and the final semester of the initiative, we're going to be exploring a foundational question. You know, what are the politics of the creative economy? In this current age of gentrification, is it possible to be a young artist in New York? Has the development of the city's creative economy helped or exacerbated existing inequalities? So this evening we convened uh, our distinguished panel to address these and, and other questions. I'm going to do brief introductions, and that's it for housekeeping for me. I'll get out of your way and let the, the evening commence. Thomas Frank will be here momentarily. He has had a train delay. I'll go on and introduce him. Um, Tom's the author of a number of books, including Pity the Billionaire, The Wrecking Crew, What's a Matter of Kansas, and One Market Under God. He's the founding editor of The Baffler, and he's been a contributor to Harper's, The Wall Street Journal, and a number of other publications. It's also our pleasure to welcome Jenny Gersten. Ms. Gersten was recently named the executive director of Friends of the High Line, the not-for-profit organization in partnership with the New York Parks Department in charge of building and maintaining one of the greatest public spaces in New York City. For the preceding four years, she was the artistic director of the Williamstown Theater Festival. And as artistic director, she programmed an ambitious summer stock season of eight fully produced top-notch professional productions in a nine-week time span. Ms. Gerson also served as the associate producer of the Public Theater in New York for four years. We're also honored to welcome Andy C. Pratt, Professor of Cultural Economy at City University London. Professor Pratt specializes in the analysis of the cultural industries internationally. He has worked as an advisor for international, national, and uh, urban policymakers, and has developed definitions of the cultural sector that are used as standard measures by the United Nations Conference on Trade and, Devel Trade and Development and UNESCO. Professor's research, Professor Stratt's, Pratt's research has three strands, the urban spatial clustering of cultural industries, the definition and measurement of employment and trade, and policy making and governance in both theory and practice. In completing our panel, we're pleased to host, host Martha Rossler. Ms. Rossler is an influential video, ins video installation and performance artist and an eminent writer on art and culture. Her work focuses on the public sphere as well as daily life. Her concerns include women's experience, architecture, war, the media, housing, homelessness, and transportation systems. She's lectured extensively nationally and internationally and has taught photography and media at Rutgers and several other places. She's had numerous solo exhibitions, including the Museum of Modern Art here in New York in 2012, and her essays have been published widely in catalogs, magazines, journals, and edited collections. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's moderator, the Graduate Center's own Sharon Zukin, without which this event would be entirely impossible. Sharon is a professor of sociology at Brooklyn College and here at the Graduate Center, and she's best known for her classic book, Loft Living, a penetrating study of the artist-driven loft markets of Lower Manhattan and the cultures of cities. She won the Jane Jacobs Award for Urban, Communica for Urban Communication for Naked City, The Death and Life of Authentic Urban Places. She's also received the C. Wright Mills Award for her book, Landscapes of Power, and the Robert Park Award for Career Achievement in Urban Sociology. And now I'll turn it over to Sharon. Thanks again. Please join me in welcoming the panel. Thank you all very much for coming out on this cold, incipiently snowy evening. <laughs> and it's almost an intimate gathering with a few of you and a, and a few of us. So I hope we'll have a good conversation. Uh, some of the panelists have been working for a very long time on and in the creative economy. Uh, I remember going to a remarkable exhibition of photographs of um, uh, apartment houses, tenements, storefronts, organized by Hans Hacke, the German artist who has worked a lot in New York, 
1971, his exhibition, Shapolsky et al, Manhattan Real Estate Holdings, a real-time social system, exposed uh, the, um, uh, the grievances of tenants of uh, so-called slumlords and alerted us to the really interesting uses of art to document social conditions in which artists and others lived in our city. And then in the late 1980s, Martha Rossler's exhibition, If You Lived Here, unearthed the same kinds of documentation and showed how homelessness had become a huge problem in New York City. Uh, in between the two exhibitions was the real estate show of 1980 when Colab, uh, a group of East Village artists, uh, put together documentation, again, of the conditions of real estate owners and developers that uh, impacted creative artists and working people in New York City. Now, Colab itself moved from the East Village to the Lower East Side in the late 1970s and eventually uh, influenced the development of ABC No Rio, some of, whose, uh, some of those pictures from that time uh, are on exhibit at the James Fuentes Gallery. I've been asked to announce that on behalf of some of our image contributors in the grid behind me. Um, and uh, if you go to the James Fuentes Gallery at 55 Delancey Street, you can relive uh, some, of those, uh, some of those years, which some people think of as the height of the creative economy in New York City. So let me start with that. Uh, while welcoming Tom, uh, at least somebody who looks looks to be Tom, uh, to, uh, to join I look us. Like I uh, stand in for him all the time. Okay, well, uh, welcome back from the land of Amtrak, and uh, we'll we'll get you up to speed, even though you have not been up to speed in the past hour. Uh, so let, let's let's start uh, by leaping back to the past. Why do people say the 1970s and early 1980s represent the high point? of the creative economy in New York City. Weren't those the bad years? Why, why are they the good years? Martha, bring us back to that time. You mean the years when I was living in San Diego, California? Well, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> well so we're all strangers. Because it was, um, uh, in many ways, the wilderness left behind when white people and the middle class left the city, which meant that low rent, sleazy ass, bohemian artists like me and my friends could uh, secure a, a large, large space in which to live, work, and do shows like uh, the real estate show and uh, uh, repo history and all kinds of things. So there were, um, since New York was a disaster zone in so many ways and people were kind of hiding their eyes, uh, and the city was trying to figure out how to recover from the near default. Um, uh, artists were able to do whatever it is that artists do when no one is looking. So. What, what do you think about that, Andy? Obviously, we're not here in the 1970s, but uh, how, London does not operate so differently, certainly not the property market. Uh, what, do, do the creative arts need detritus? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think you just said that they, they thrive in those opportunities, is interstices and the gaps in between and make something happen in them. Um, and I mean, I think you can reduce it to some economic circumstances, but I think that's what the arts do all the time. They look for opportunities, look for new ways of doing things. And I think uh, um, you can see that uh, in London as well. There have been um, opportunities that have been uh, um, grasped there, and a lot of people have uh, talked about uh, the east part of London um, that uh, traditionally has been um, uh, uh, very uh, very poor, uh, has been the area where artists have 
in a way colonized and uh, have developed there as well partially because of these reasons because um, space and is available and land is cheap etc um, but I mean I think that's only one part of it there's a broader shift I mean I think London and, and, and New York are great examples of where there's this huge sort of uh, um, cultural and artistic sort of uh, dynamism um, running through them and I think it's the linkage between these possibilities of developing things but also the overall dynamism and I think uh, particularly um, through the uh, 60s and 70s uh, um, and onwards uh, uh, London and New York are both have sort of powered forward in that way and you know, I'll just throw in one thing really that uh, I think in both cases has driven uh, both of these uh, places and that is um, immigration and diversity and this huge constant attempt to reinvent reinvent the self and reinvent identity and challenge different identities I think is is a really powerful thing so space is in between but also lots of challenge I think is the thing that uh, gives great grounds for growing artistic um, um, challenges and inventiveness I think. that sounds awfully awfully much like artists thrive on adversity and I'm not sure how I feel about that. I don't know, Jenny, you grew up in New York yeah. what, and you have recently returned in, in a responsible position as an adult. Uh, what's, what's, your <laughs> feeling, what's your feeling about the bad, the bad old days, good old days? Well, you know, the interesting thing about the bad old days is they were pretty bad. I mean, they were, it was an upsetting time to be in New York as a, I was, a, you know, a younger person then, and uh, but oh they yeah. also allowed. I mean, as as you're talking about opportunism, they also allowed philanthropists to begin to take opportunities to make the city better. So, I mean, the the whole rise we're seeing with private public partnerships that's thriving right now started back in the 70s. Think about Doris Friedman starting uh, the Public Art Fund to make New York City look better. I mean, she went straight into Soho in the East Village and all over the different neighborhoods of Manhattan to create opportunities for artists and to make the city look better. Mm -hmm. And that was very much in tandem with mm -hmm. um, the idea that you could do something to make, you know, to activate your city. Mm -hmm. Well, that's absolutely true. I've, I've uh, written about uh, the uh, Bryant Park uh, partnership. I'm not sure what the current name of, of, the, the, of the partnership is, of the bid is. And I've also written about the Union Square partnership. And it's absolutely true that in the 1970s, uh, various corporate leaders, as well as philanthropists, uh, uh, took, the, took the, the opportunity, actually, to create public-private partnerships that until then had just been explored in tourism and advertising New York um, to, uh, and really tried to remake public space in a more friendly, more, more useful way with advantages and disadvantages for the, the, um, the precedent that was set. Tom, what about you? I mean, arguably, you've been writing about uh, creatives since you wrote about the advertising revolution of the early 1960s. And that's a, that's a different... Yeah, they made a TV show of it. Did you see this? Oh, yes, I heard, I heard, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what's, what's your feeling about art thriving in, um, in, in detritus? Mm. Okay, so the period that you're talking about, uh, yeah, like I was 13. And I lived in Kansas City, and well, then the, the New I, York must have seemed very glamorous indeed. Yeah. No, we hated them, the Yankees. Remember that? They'd always beat my Royals, like all the time. We'd yeah. get to the playoffs, and you know, the same damn thing would happen. No, New York was this exotic. I, I couldn't imagine what New York was. Let me just say, um, I mean, I'll talk about the creative revolution in advertising at some point. I'm sure that. What was you know, going on in 1979, I, I recently read this book by George Packard. You all read this, The Unwinding. Mm -hmm. Youngstown, Ohio still had steel mills, right? Today, you know, I really don't follow what goes on in Youngstown, Ohio, but I can almost guarantee you that they've invested you know, tax dollars in some kind of uh, vibrancy program, right? To try, to try to save their city by bringing in the creative class. Uh, cities all over America are doing this. And New York looks great today, you know. But if that's the trade, give me Youngstown, Ohio. You know, give me the uh, industrial Midwest any day. A thriving industrial country 
versus a you know country where you have a handful of creatives having a really good time in uh, Wicker Park or someplace like that. To hell with it. That's my opinion. Sorry, <laughs> that's not exactly what you asked, but. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, that's fair enough, Martha. You know, you don't have to ask my permission to speak, everyone. Just, you know, go right ahead. I would also like to posit the possibility that artists do better in places where they, there is very little to no market discipline and uh, low level of professionalization. And that characterizes the 70s uh, in many ways more than the question of urban detritus because we weren't picking, I, I actually lived in New York, I'm, I'm from New York and I lived in New York in 74, 75, so I did sort of live here during the worst of the uh, fiscal crisis. So where there, are, uh, the 60s was a period in which the international art market moved to New York, but a great deal of what went on among artists who were still putatively identified with the Bohemia was a struggle against market domination. And in fact, the market didn't actually capture the imagination of young artists until 1980. Uh, so there was a long period in which artists saw their realm not only as transformative of you know, the aesthetic realm, but of all of society because we're messianic but also as in active opposition to the sort of capitalist vision of what uh, life and morality should be. So uh, the artists were neither professional nor middle class by identification. We could argue about what other way they identified. I'd also like to say something about the Public Art Fund, which somewhere it, under Doris Friedman, um, was, as you say, it was a philanthropic effort to kind of create a space in which art functioned within a city. But what happened about 20 years later was that the entire idea of what public art might be was completely transformed and spectacularized. And the same thing happened with the art world. So the public art fund of today is a very different entity under Susan and under Doris, though Susan isn't. Backstage. I think you could add that, I mean, that, 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 that's, I mean, just in parallel, if we look at, at London as well, in terms of you know, what's, what was being explored in the 60s and 70s and, and has continued, has been where artists have, as you say, have used the opportunity when the economy has been sort of uh, um, rocking in some Budget, way yeah. to, to actually offer the critique and offer there's, where there's opportunities there. I mean, it's really, really interesting that uh, um, one of the um, working in this space bit where there is all this, these challenges to find uh, creative space, as in studio space or even places to live and survive as an artist, um, that um, artists have often been at the forefront of that. And so one of the ex uh, experiments, which was an experiment then became an institution, was um, space. In, in London, it was called Space um, Gallery. Um, it was started by Bridget Riley. It was uh, quite well known, um, and basically, it was a, an attempt to create uh, artist studios that were co-owned by artists, um, a collective workshop space, um, and try to um, um, protect artists in a way from the uh, the sort of rental hikes that, that go on all the time. Um, and create spaces where artists could survive and continue to survive in the city. And this has been really popular in London. Space continues. It has now 19 groups of galleries uh, around London. There are other organizations such as Acme also do the similar thing. It's quite popular uh, across, uh, across Europe. This idea of artists finding a way, a solution, of, in, a, say, uh, in parallel and outside the market, um, so they can survive and do what they do and not get uh, constantly ejected um, in the uh, standard round of uh, the way that arts are used in an instrumental way for regeneration projects whereby they're just, in a sense, candy floss to draw in the investors to create some more condominiums in some way, which, uh, you know, is, is, a, is a, it sounds like a stereotype, but unfortunately it's, a, it's one that plays and plays in almost every city. And I think... That's a really important part that we've focused on 
the artists aren't just sort of uh, there in the, in the ruins. They're actually trying to do something as they, in those opportunities. But also the way in which the rest of uh, society and, and cities see art and, and artists is somehow as a, as a, as a uh, prelude to something else rather than actually uh, intrinsically doing um, something positive there. And I think this focus, as you said, on the spectacularization of art is very much in a model that art and art and creativity and culture is very much seen as a consumption thing. Um, and it's just something to be consumed rather than art as production, art as something that is made and remade and is an essential part of that. And I think we often only see one of these sides and it's this consumption size, the spectacularization of it, which is wonderful, but actually requires people to make art and do art and live and work, <laughs> etc. cetera. Um, and that's often left out of the conversation, I think. And, uh, and increasingly, I think, in the policy world, um, they're beginning very, very slowly to make, wake up to this. The problem is they don't quite know what to do with it. Well, yes, we have art as work, as performance, as uh, composition, as, as writing, as, uh, as, as visualization and presenting a visualization. And then we have art as consumption, as accessory to consumption. And we have art as sale, right? Art as, uh, so we have all these multiple markets for things in, in the great cities that call themselves and others call them cultural capitals, like New York like London, uh, but how can artists be economically supported in their production? What's the, what's the, the, the model that can be sustained and that can sustain artists if they're not selling their work to the highest bidder, if they're not getting a salary from some central treasury? How can the arts be supported? You've, uh, Jenny, you've mentioned um, philanthropists, yeah. whether they're individual philanthropists or public-private partnerships. Government, of course, has, has always been the, uh, the major philanthropist of, uh, of artistic producers. But how can, how can artists be, how can artists support themselves if they're not working in the market? How can they survive? But, but I think that's, that's, that's part of it. I mean, you say, how can, how do, uh, is, is the point, really. And, and the how do is that most people have second jobs, or third jobs, or fourth jobs. And that's one of the um, things that we have to address about the, this field, is that uh, people survive by doing something else. Um, and the ways that we look at uh, society and economy through censuses or whatever tend to just look at people's first jobs and they don't see the amount of activity um, going on. And this codependency is really, really important to understand how this sort of ecosystem operates in a way. However, that's the, that's in a sense the positive part of it. The other, the more negative part of it is... That's the positive yeah, part. Yeah, that's wait, the positive wait, just, part. Wait, just let's pause. Could we pause there just let, for just, a moment? Uh, let me just add the rider to, to that positive part. Let's look at that. Is, is that actually what you're seeing is a huge growth of the intern culture as well, mm -hmm. which is another part of the <laughs> cultural economy. So that's, that, that's the... Uh, this huge huge expansion um, mm -hmm. now, which is being seen as the poster child for the rest of the economy mm -hmm. uh, as well. So, um, so yeah, let's pause a moment in terms of looking at cultural work and how people get by mm -hmm. uh, and the conditions under which they have to survive and um, under which these organizations survive, which are by these creating these forms of work, um, which I don't think uh, many of us would want to recommend to uh, our nearest and dearest. You know, so. Well, in, in the pause, if I may take the opportunity, <laughs> every survey, as, as you well know, every survey that has been done of artists, certainly in the United States, shows that they earn very little money from their art. They cannot support themselves, for the most part, from their art work. Uh, but the sources of other jobs have become, as you say, very tenuous, uh, supporting freelance project work. And even that has dried up in recent years. Now, is it the, uh, the recession that began in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2006 <laughs> or 2007? Or is it a more structural change in the US economy 
that has really uh, uh, swallowed up the middle market mm -hmm. for artists where you, ha uh, yeah, Tom. Yeah, uh, oh, well, I'm, sorry. I'm just gonna, no, I'm just gonna agree with you. Every, you got, everybody's saying things that I was going to say. This is very disturbing <laughs> okay. to me. I thought I was going to come in here and argue with everyone. Well, you got us off on Youngstown and I admit that was pretty uh, okay, challenging. But, yeah. so, <laughs> what you're saying is exactly right. I mean, structural changes. So uh, when I got out of graduate school in the mid 1990s, and I wanna sort of broaden uh, the, the subject here, not just visual artists, but creative workers in general, and uh, you know, I, I, I had, is that, what, am I, is that okay? Please. Yeah, okay. And uh, I had like, um, you know, committed the, the extreme folly of getting a PhD in history. <laughs> and in, in this PhD, you know, in cultural history, I had written about the creative revolution in advertising. Well, that, that doesn't matter anyway. But th th that's when this, this structural change was well underway in academia. Um, you described the culture of using interns in academia, it's adjuncts. Um, you know, essentially anything they can do to drive the, to drive the wages down and down and down. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right, we're in an academic institution here and I apologize for that. No, I don't apologize We for understand, that. yes. And then news, newspapers went, you know, a little short while after that. National magazines are going now. I had a lot of friends that were musicians and I don't want to cry any tears for the record industry. <laughs> but the, what's happened has actually gotten, it's actually worse now than it was in the, in the mid 1990s. The irony of all this, the, the reason this is worth dwelling on is because at the same time as these dreadful things are happening, you know, my friends in all of these different fields can't get jobs, you know, and we're learning these sort of really ugly lessons about, uh, you know, about, about creative life and intellectual life, there's this celebration going on of, of the, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the creative class. Uh, when did Richard Florida's book come out? 2002, I believe. And he actually says that creative workers are the dominant mm -hmm. class in America and that, you know, that, that uh, employers have to follow them, have to chase them, and cities have to uh, rework themselves in order to appeal to them, to make themselves attractive for people like me and my friends. And this, this just struck me as so, uh, you know, incredibly fatuous. I couldn't believe it was actually, uh, that someone would actually write this. I mean, um, yeah. And become popular and, too. And, and, and then, do you ever go through an airport? Have you been through an airport lately and gone to the bookstore? And you notice all these books about creativity. This is the role. This is what we do. This is what, who we are, right? We are um, models. We're like, you know, photographic models. We're like, uh, we're, you know, so they can take our picture and say, look, that's what creative people are like, businessmen. Be like that, you know? So that, you know, that, that's, that's, that's what our job is, is to provide these kind of mannequins for, you know, uh, creative theorists. It never works the other way, right? They never write books for, you know, I write, I write literary essays, right? They never write books for uh, authors of essays and say, look at this guy who invented the slinky, you know? <laughs> you, should, you should think outside the box like him. You should take lessons from his life. It's always, it always flows in the other direction and it flows without any regard to what is actually going on in the world of, of creative work. The, the uh, artist figure is a cipher mm -hmm, who is used mm -hmm. to represent something uh, a class of which artists are wholly uh, absent, which is the creative class. Yeah. And if you it's, read it's Florida's book, it's a spectacularization book, thing. Yeah. Well, if you read Florida's book, it becomes clear very quickly that artists are not creatives. They are something else. Creatives, in fact, are people who are in IT and slinky makers, or as you have written, the people who invent post-its for a 3M or whatever the hell it is. Well, there, there are um, three things going on here, if I, if I may. Num number one, um, Florida has been taken to task by uh, some other academics for including accountants and lawyers mm -hmm. in the so-called creative class. But second, uh, second, we're, um, you know, there really are two pockets, and I, and I know Andy will, will speak to this. There really are two different pockets of uh, the, su the supposed creative personnel of the new economy. And part of, a, a, a part of one pocket is the video games uh, producers, uh, designers, and IT people who work in so-called creative industries, as, and the other pocket of that 
creative workforce is the visual artists, the writers, the, the imaginaries. Um, but then there's a third definition of creatives uh, that is running around. Uh, and Martha has put it very well in, um, in her recent book of essays, Creatives, she writes, that amorphous group of brewers, bakers, urban farmers, and baristas, sponsored by banks, corporations, and foundations, and used for branding purposes. Mm -hmm. So that there are maybe three different pockets of creativity uh, that, we're, that we're all talking about. I, I, just, I just think there's a real problem with term creativity, uh, each time I hear it, I want to reach my gun, really. It's, it's, I mean, it really is of, of that character. And of course, we're, we're, we're caught up because um, the policymakers and politicians have, uh, have, have, have got this. And that's our point of entry, in a way. And this is the Faustian bargain, in some way. Um, but really, we have to reject all the terms that, that, that come with it. Uh, because, I mean, part of the problem with creativity is this basic problem on the sort of romantic vision of the artist and of the individual genius, in a way. And, of course, we know that the construction of any um, creative work is about a collective in some way. It's about individuals, but they have to work together. It requires people to be audiences. It requires people to make the paints. It requires people, you know, all this activity. It's not just one individual. And that's, I think, quite a different um, issue um, from the individual artist. And this interaction in terms of artistic community um, or a creative community, which is constantly in development. So it's not just fine artists. It's about video games or whatever develops tomorrow. It's about new creative skills. And what is really, really interesting, I think, about some of these new areas that uh, um, confound our, our judgments about where boundaries ought to be is that some of the most dynamic things are happening, as always have, have happened with uh, culture and creative uh, work, um, trying to weave together a range of different skills. So computer games are a really interesting case. First, they make loads of money. Okay, so that's sort of quite interesting and bizarre for artistic and cultural activity. But they're about a weaving together of technology skills and also fine art skills, storytelling skills, narrative and coding, putting them together. And this is something that these two communities are not meant to be able to do very well together. But they are an example of that. And a lot of contemporary filmmaking, because there's so much CGI in it, is about this as well. So I think one of the things that is, this demonstrates is this ability to think across different mindsets uh, in different ways. And, and I think that has been one of the revolutionizing um, elements, which is why we're seeing increasingly a spillover, if you like, of the so-called creatives, I would really prefer the term cultural economy, um, uh, as it's impacting in the, in the rest of the economy. And if you look at those sorts of jobs, the, the interrelationships of those sorts of jobs, they're becoming increasingly important in economies. So in London, that's the third largest group of people um, in terms of London's economy. So this is... But this it's, is not the th uh, it's, it's not the third largest group in terms of New York's economy, I believe. It's no, no, it's, it's only 8% in, 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 in New York. So New York's Wait a second. Be behind I, I, the patch. Just second. So I was watching one of the, the, the event that you did in December with uh, Ed Glazer and uh, uh, David Harvey, and they had this hilarious fact. What is the... Uh, percentage of, uh, of New York's GNP that's, con that's, you know, the financial industry. Mm -hmm. What is it? Do you remember? I don't, I don't, oh, God, I was there, it's, but it's I more than know. half. Yeah. It's, it's something quite, you know. Yeah. This yeah. is a fire industry town. We all know that. But you said so many things that I have philosophical disagreements with that I can't even remember them. The first <laughs> is we would actually have to have a discussion about authorship and agency and what and I noticed that when you wanted to talk about, now I'm all in favor of contextualization. To call it collaboration, I'm not so sure. But you immediately began talking about the industrialization of the creative impulse into movies and video games and so on. So let's just leave that there. Um, but um, the pre, it's, it's like we are sort of dancing around things that one might have, ex well, we kind of got there, but not really what people like David Harvey at all would be talking about, which is precaritization and the way that uh, 
Oh, I'd like to step back for a minute and say, of course he includes accountants because really talking about knowledge workers. For Florida, it's a class issue. He never, he talks about it and then he discounts it. He says, I'm not talking about class. And then every single thing he does is actually based on class distinctions. He sees the service workers as kind of nature to the culture of all the people he's interested in, the creatives and the core creatives. So, I mean, there's just no question. I mean, if we're gonna talk about Youngstown or wherever that we're talking about working class, productive industries as opposed to middle class office workers for whom artists are the model. Uh, the office may be uh, virtualized and yet that's who the artist is supposed to be, who creative people are supposed to be. I kind of lost the thread of my little rant because I wanted to talk about accountants, but, but I think you know, you know the whole quest, because of course they're hardly precarious, but the way in which creativity is constantly being institutionalized and deinstitutionalized helps to account for, I mean, it's got its real world that is physical world uh, analog in the way that artists are, as you say, cotton candy. <laughs> candy floss. Can that's cotton same. candy. Yeah. I think that's the same thing, isn't it? It is the same thing <laughs> in neighborhoods. But you know, that process wasn't so apparent in the 70s or 80s. Even though it was, as Sharon pointed out, chapter and verse, it was a plot by city elites. It wasn't at all apparent. Now it's very clear and it's very quick and it's become policy. So I'll stop. So why now? Why, why the focus on creativity now? Now it's true that Richard Florida wrote a book in 2002 that has become enormously popular around the world and uh, creative uh, strategies of redevelopment or cultural strategies really of, of redevelopment uh, are being uh, implemented in uh, Latin America uh, to, uh, to some degree in Asia. Uh, they've just become uh, 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 archetypes of what would seem to be a consensual, conflict-free, very pleasant sort of uh, uh, beautiful city to live in. At least that's the, that's the model. Why now? Why in the early 2000s? Yeah? Well, isn't it all based on entrepreneurism and the rise of the entrepreneurial class as a, as a, as a sort of method for make, making people a lot of money? I mean, you, you're looking at these cities and, and, or, or, or communities in, um, in Southern California and elsewhere that are thinking outside of the box and, and, and they're young cultures and they're vibrant cultures and they're, they're thinking entrepreneurially and, and, and sometimes they're being enormously successful and then making people a lot of money. So they're looking to apply that model unilaterally. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I haven't read Florida's book, so. Uh, well, I, uh, but, but we, but you know, we're we're all familiar with the idea that there is a creative class, and and that uh, uh, there there is there are benefits to be derived for uh, by cities if they can, as as uh, Tom I think said a few minutes ago, if they can. Or, uh, uh, Andy, if they can build an infrastructure of amenities for the creative class, bike paths and hey. uh, cafes. I, there's, I have, there's, there's actually a good answer to this, to this yeah. question. And to, to, to say why is creativity, you know, this hot stuff right now, uh, you have to go back quite a bit. So uh, I'm the, 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 the first book that I ever wrote was called The Conquest of Cool. It was about the I, advertising industry in the 1960s. They made a TV show out they of it. They made that. a TV. Sorry, I already mentioned it. Sorry. So they already made a TV show out of it. But, but what I discovered um, in the course of my research writing that book is that the rise of creativity in the 60s, when creativity first became this uh, revered concept in American life, and particularly in American business, uh, you know, in the advertising industry and elsewhere, it was related to a shift in the way business understood itself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, well, I mean, in, in grand terms, a shift in the way capital operated, mm -hmm. okay? So you went from the organization man style uh, of, you know, business theory to the sort of Tom Peters, you know, the, or the predecessors of Tom Peters, like the guy that wrote up the organization, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, this whole capitalism was just completely re-envisioning itself 
and creativity was the language that it used to describe that. I also found that creativity was deployed, if you, you know, to use the, uh, the sort of military word, deployed uh, to head off a certain critique of capitalism. The right. critique of capitalism, you remember Vance Packard? Well, that book, The Organization Man, which was a critique of capitalism. That whole critique known as the mass society critique, where capitalism was depersonalizing everybody and it was the lonely crowd and it was you know everybody wearing gray flannel suits and all this kind of thing. Creativity, um, had, creativity defeats that, uh, that, critique of that particular critique of capitalism. You know, advertising, which had been in the 50s and the early 60s, you know, the most uh, sort of demonized aspect of American enterprise became, in the 1960s, became you know, the, 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 the leader of this you know, new entrepreneurial attitude. And the, you know, they became, um, I don't want to say ad men became beloved figures, but their, their, their public image definitely changed to, the, to what they are today, right? They're always the hippest guy on the commuter train, right? They're always so much cooler than you are, than you can ever hope to be. And I see, and, okay, so this is not just, um, you know, let's, let's talk about the past. This is what's happening again now. What's the challenge facing capitalism now? Uh, what's happening now? The, I mean, the, the, the biggest, most obvious thing, look at the financial crisis, you know, five years ago. Look at the Enron crisis a few years before that. One after another after another, these, these fantastic disasters. And uh, you also have this very powerful critique of inequality. That's, you know, almost everyone, if they think about it, or a large percentage of the public would agree with. And um, what I have you know, learned from you know, my lifetime of reading the Wall Street Journal and reading all of these management books is that capitalism is, or, or the, the people who think for the business class are extremely sensitive to criticism. And it's not like this, that, like this stuff has been planned, but once again, creativity is coming to the rescue. <laughs> Sorry? What? Artists are sensitive to criticism. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, no, no, like the people that write, you know, the, uh, say the American Enterprise Institute or the Cato Institute down in Washington, D.C. They're forever dreaming up ways to, or, or, you know, like Reason Magazine or something like this, forever dreaming up ways to defend, uh, you know, free markets from any kind of criticism that you might make. And creativity is intensely useful in that kind of situation. Think about what you just said about uh, Richard Florida and the creative class. Who is the creative class? Well, it's not us, mm -hmm. right? It's not us. It's, it's those guys, mm -hmm. right? It's those guys <laughs> yeah. down on Wall Street, man. That's, that's who it is. How can you criticize creative people? But there's, there's another thing that, that, that uh, in, a, in a sense, that, uh, that creativity there is being used as a, as a solution to solve, in a sense, one of the problems of capital at the moment. I mean, you know, coming back to Richard Florida, Richard Florida, as far as I'm concerned, based his book on Daniel Bell, basically. Yes. Um, and Daniel Bell wrote a book after post-industrial society, and it was the cultural contradictions of capitalism. of capitalism. And this is a central part of the whole problem, that it didn't solve the problem, mm -hmm. it generated another problem um, in a way. And this tension between the development of an of a idealized uh, sort of consumer society that somehow doesn't play out in that way. One of the huge central structural issues, aside from the organizational sort of changes and reputational changes, is basically overconsumption. And how do you solve overconsumption? You try to get people to buy more and more of, 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 of items. Um, the, one of the, the, the things that comes beyond, after that is that you have to convince them um, to uh, differentiate between products. And of course, this is where advertising comes in. Mm -hmm. And all of the skills that are associated with the growth of um, creative work is that that's what artists do to an extent, they refine our capabilities of, of, um, of, um, consumption. Um, of both of consumption, but also of the, the artistic palette in some way. And therefore, we're obsolescence, sell it. isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yes, we, uh, we bring obsolescence. Yeah. We, yeah. Okay, so just to, to recap, um, creativity, uh, the rhetoric of creativity, the discourse of creativity is useful uh, to, uh, to reform, at least cosmetically, a crisis of capitalism. Uh, I think in some grand way. I don't yes. think it's, it's not planned. It just, mm -hmm. these things work out, you know. <laughs> they just happen. <laughs> well, they don't just happen. No, they, they don't. <laughs> that's, that's my dialectic but of history. One of the, you know? one of the, one of the major happens. shifts, surely, that, that, that has <laughs> happened is, is that we don't, we don't 
Well, very few goods now do we buy simply on the basis of price comparison. It's how they look, good they look. It's issues of design and all yeah. this sort of stuff that we've, we've convinced ourselves is the major thing. And that's, that's where the creative class, in terms of the real sense of involving creative work, and a whole suite of activities um, is increasingly engaged in the workforce doing this work of creating um, a whole range of, uh, of different choices um, for us, which of course is uh, you know, help, helpfully supported through advertising, et cetera, et cetera, that helps to keep that system going. But it needs this constant cannon fodder of more creatives. Um, well, that might be true things. for people who produce certain kinds of text and certain kinds of visual images. But what about the performing arts? I mean, they're really just the icing on the cake, no? What do you think? What's the economic use of the performing arts? Oh. Well, don't we want to... You have to have a reserve army of waiters and like people that work at Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, you know, I mean, part of the crisis... I'm sorry, that, that's a joke, part of, the, sorry. part of the crisis is indeed all of these, you know, well-trained uh, art school graduates and drama school graduates, right? Yes. Music school graduates. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I mean, isn't basically the performing arts a variation of sitting around the fire and telling stories? I mean, and don't we need that in order to be okay as a society? I mean, aren't we going into a theater or an opera or a dance piece to learn something about each other and, and, the ex and expression in ways that we don't, I mean, maybe that's very idealistic no, of me. No, I, I agree, but who's going to pay for that? Well, and are there any performing artists in this room? Because if I was one, which I almost am, I would want to throw myself in front of a bus after this talk. You should. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, the, the, so, so how, the cliff how, how, is in front of you <laughs> on the basis of what you just said, because since you've chosen to hang the performing arts on questions of narrativity, we have to recognize that at the central core of the question of creativity is its companion, narrativity. And if you listen to national public radio, it's become a vast wasteland of amateur narrativity. That is, mm. all those goddamn shows like The Moth and, uh, yeah. But I'd also uh, say, uh, like, but this also, American, yeah, this That's American good. Life, I've published it already. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, other shows depend on the amateurization, the deprofessionalization of the theatrical experience. Because we are descending from the idea of culture as an elite pursuit something that our taste is always running to catch up with, with the idea that we, the entire uh, section of the middle class that dreams it's creative, it, even if it's an accountant or a video game designer or whatever, that the true creative narrativity is within us. This is actually a oh. kind of collapse of culture that imperils all the performing arts. Yeah. There was a time when the Republican elites, or at least their wives, believed that they needed to shield opera and dance and so on from the cost of actually producing these things. But now they don't feel that way anymore. Yeah. But I mean, but I'm not, I mean, and, I, and then we could get into an entire attack about YouTube and how YouTube's, you know, ruining uh, cultural, cultural in this country also and worldwide. But the other thing I want to say about the performing arts is it's not just about, it's not just the, the narrative piece, but it's that idea of a communal experience, which I do deeply believe in, and a live experience and a shared experience, which in this digital age, we are becoming further and further removed from. We're not home alone listening to our radios but or in our cars. We're it's collecting. an imaginary community if it's trans transmitted by virtual means, whether it's the radio. No, I'm talking about live, like ah, parts. That, yeah. That's still, that I hold on to that as a value. That is I'm still. on your side. Okay. <laughs> oh, now we're all on the same side. Okay, okay, fine. <laughs> uh, what, what happens to independent art producers and even uh, independent arts organizations that try to show uh, art. I'm thinking, for example, of the news article from the other day that uh, the Tribeca Film Festival has joined forces with Madison Square Garden, <laughs> not the building, but the uh, the enterprise they that sold owns the Madison piece of Square Garden. Um, what you know? Uh, again, trying to think about uh, how economically to support artwork. What is the future 
of independent arts producers, not just individuals, but independent organizations. Again, Jenny, I turn to you first because you've been in that world. It's an increasingly difficult, um, I believe that the model of sustainability for, for independent producers of art work, what be it performing arts or other types, is becoming challenging. I mean, you're seeing admissions soar to prices that are astronomical. And I mean, many. Now, there's obviously exceptions to all of this. Yeah. Um, and I think that the, you know, all of these many cultural organizations were were, rose in the time of the Ford Foundation and major NEA subsidy, and that's virtually all but gone. Mm -hmm. You know, not just those two organizations, but the foundation support in general for just general support to create these organizations and these cultural organizations. All they've done is grown. All they've done is gotten bigger and increased their mm -hmm. capacity because there's been demand. But now there's just a vast network, so it's a it's a become a real challenge. I don't have. I mean, I I struggled with this when I worked in theater because I kept looking at the our budgets, our operating budgets, and going, well, all we have to do is raise ticket prices and then it'll work. But we didn't want to raise ticket mm -hmm. prices, and we don't, and we want to pay artists a living wage. I mean, most of the artists that we employed are living at or below the poverty level. It's so, except for the, you know, movie stars, um, you know, so it's very distressing to be a part of. Mm -hmm. I don't have the answer. I'm, I'll keep working on it. Andy, we, we were talking about this before, uh, the, the panelists, before the, uh, the, the event began. Uh, does the UK have, have any positive examples to, uh, to offer? <laughs> about funding the arts? Um, or has it all been downhill since Margaret Thatcher? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think clearly there are entirely different sort of macro funding systems in terms of the, the state in, in Europe and in the UK has uh, always had a very substantial role in terms of uh, um, arts uh, and cultural funding. Um, and the UK is somewhere in between, in a sense, because uh, it's gone more down the liberalization uh, route. Um, and what is interesting is that there, the, there's, whereas in Germany or France, for example, there's more of a unitary sort of state public support model, um, what you've got in the UK now is uh, some sort of transitional uh, model. Um, and um, it's very, very difficult now to actually identify who's an independent or who's uh, um, self-financed in some way or working outside the system, financed by the state or financed by somebody else, because everything is mixed now. And that uh, even public funding now is, uh, whilst headline, it's like the theatres, for example, publicly funded, but they're mainly supported by a whole range of sponsorship deals as well. Um, so actually, you really have to look at the accounts and look at the money to find out where things are going. And uh, I think this, is, this has become very, very confusing in a sense about actually where it seemed comforting in the past to be able to draw these lines between what was public and what was private. Now it's a lot more mixed and you have to look in a lot more intricate way. Um, and looking in the sense that the other side of that, we, we, we hear about independent film producers and music producers, music business, for example. There are three companies, basically, that own the music business. Three companies, and they have lots and lots of sub-companies that are parts of them that have different names. They're the so-called independents, but <laughs> they're owned by three companies. The advertising industry is the same yeah. as well. Okay? So these organizations operate on the basis of a, of a, of a, a, a faux independence because they want to trumpet their creativity in a way, but they're not. And so you have all of that is this appearance of uh, independence. Um, and it's even happening in, the, in what was the formerly um, um, publicly funded sector now, I think. Um, and that raises all sorts of massive questions that we don't have time to talk about, which are about governance, about how you actually achieve particular objectives that may be in a, in a, in a, in a particular community interest or a public interest um, with these organizations now that have so many different stakeholders that have so many different sets of interests. So you lose way. your autonomy. Yeah. yeah. 
Let me just take one minute to ask the audience to fill out question cards if you have a question that you'd like asked. I'm sorry, the procedure is a bit cumbersome, but uh, when you came in, you were given a card uh, at the front table. And if you have a question that you would like the panel to speak to, please write it down on that, uh, on that card. And Mara? Is, uh, uh, Mara will, will uh, come down uh, one of the aisles, about this aisle. Mara will come down the aisle if you'll pass your, uh, your car, question cards over to uh, your right. She will collect the cards. And uh, we, will, we will somehow get questions asked in a few minutes. So please, if you have questions, uh, write them on the cards and send them down to your right. Uh, that brings up a really interesting question. Cultural policy. Do we have a cultural <laughs> policy in New York City? When I go to other parts of the world, people always say, ah, oh, New York, cultural capital, what is your cultural policy? And I always say, but we don't have a cultural policy. And people say, Soho, isn't that an artist district? Well, maybe it was an artist district, or Bushwick, or Williamsburg. We don't have an artist district. I mean, we've had certain <coughs> kinds of um, uh, laws uh, that are, were intended to give artists first crack at certain kinds of space, the AIR, AIR program and the Department of Cultural mm -hmm. Affairs. Um, the zoning regulation in Soho, which is not even honored in the breach, that artists and art-related businesses should, again, be given first crack at uh, at, at uh, renting or buying space there. Um, so we've never had any legal artists district mm -hmm. in New York City. So do we have a cultural policy? Does London have a cultural policy? Does any city have a cultural policy? I have, a, I have an interesting anecdote Please. for you. And this is again gonna sound just so completely wrongheaded. So I was out in, uh, you know, I'm from Kansas City. Kansas City's right on the state line between Kansas and Missouri, both intense cultural hotbeds, as we all know. <laughs> and um, at the time, the state of Kansas had just zero funded its art agency. Mm. And, you know, they, all the federal grants that they were going to get, you know, forget it. They didn't care. This is, you know, Governor Sam Brownback had just, uh, I mean, our future president, Sam Brownback, had just got, had just uh, taken office. And this is one of the first things that they did. And at the same time, the city of Kansas City, Missouri, right across State Line Road, was uh, you know setting up all these public-private partnerships with the local foundations and uh, and really doing this right in terms of public funding for the arts. But the theory on which they were doing it was again all this stuff about you have to attract and retain top corporate talent, and the way you do that is by building this kind of Potemkin Bohemia, you know, and uh, and all this sort of thing. And what's really hilarious or ironic or paradoxical about these two you know places right you know a stone's throw from each other taking these two exact opposite paths is that they're both trying to do the same thing which is lure corporate you know big employers into their state lure corporations to their state kansas is going to do it by cutting taxes as low as they possibly can and missouri is going to do it by uh, funding the arts mm. and uh, i have my doubts about both uh, approaches you know great test case kind of like um Minnesota mm -hmm. and Wisconsin. Yeah, but, it, but, 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 but shouldn't we, see, this is the thing where you have to step, I, I mean, I, I love it that they're funding the arts in Kansas City. It makes me very happy. And it's, that's, that was always the missing piece of that city when I was growing up there, right? And now it's there. You now it's, the a, it's a wonderful Art place. Gallery? I don't know what you're complaining about. No, 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 that's about. right. And, and your hallmark, lest we forget, right? Kansas City actually has something like the most artists per capita of any city, in, wow. in any big city in America, or something like that, really? because of hallmark, hallmark. Wow. right? They, the greeting cards, right? And, um, but that's very much what Andy was talking about before, right? <laughs> but, but I'm saying they're doing it for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, I love public support for the arts, but if you're just doing it as a way to, you know, get Boeing to move to your city or something mm -hmm. like that, you know? What would be but the right reason? it's never just one mode. Well, the, the right reason would be the New Deal reason, right? Like, like Federal One, remember? Remember when we were young in the 30s? <laughs> It's, it's, it's the President Roosevelt was well, it's, it's with the the tension between a, an instrumentalism, which is simply doing having art to do achieve some other end, right. or having some intrinsic <laughs> yes, value, or doing an intrinsic art because reason, it's art, right? Because yeah. it's like the post office has a blank wall. We got to paint that thing, yeah. you know. 
Okay, I'm sorry, it wasn't that vulgar. That was, but only, it was, because, that was only because <laughs> artists didn't have any woodworking That's skills. Right. right. Okay. But the way, you know, now they're selling those post offices, the ones with the yes. murals, right? They're, yeah, they're including poor post in, the offices. in the Bronx. Yeah. 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 How beautiful can a city get? <laughs> what do you think? Because you're in charge of the High Line now. How beautiful can a city get? How beautiful should a city be? What makes a city beautiful? As much open space as possible. <laughs> You know, green is good in a city, and open space is good. That makes a city beautiful. The opportunity for experience is a beautiful city thing. And that's, um, that's something that it doesn't have to happen in open space, but the idea of creating, you know, something that isn't just the idea of business and corporate but, and, and transportation hubs, but that there's constantly opportunities for creating, you know, for the public every day live experience, the bike paths, the every, you know, any, any different way that you can engage public in different way. Food trucks, I have to say, make a city beautiful because they're diversifying the, the, um, the food economy in the city. And I think that's valuable. Well, so. I think the thing is that they're always in tension with, with, with other, other activities. And, and if we, using that phrase, city beautiful, then we think back to the first city beautiful right. sort of, uh, and, uh, and we look right. at Washington, D.C., and what was it about? It was about basically moving the poor out of the city because they didn't look they beautiful. beautiful. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's about recreating a fabric so that it creates this, again, smacker of, uh, of an ideal society. Um, without the poor in some way. And, but interestingly uh, enough, the food trucks are generally owned, generally yes, owned so by people who yes. are college graduates, even people with MBA degrees, in contrast to uh, the food vendors who have carts or who just sell on the street, even the people who sell the, the no-name hot dogs. Uh, they, they are usually uh, immigrants, immigrants. Uh, they're usually representatives of a uh, working class. Uh, the food truck owners are much more entrepreneurial in background as well as in ambition, and they're treated somewhat differently by the police, do you know? Yeah. So it's, it, it's interesting when people, you know, when people talk about how great food trucks are, they're they're invasive also. Yeah, they're yeah, actually yeah. talking about uh, the, the, the top layer yeah. of the, the street food economy. Yeah. <laughs> Sharon, you, you're, uh, you've written a whole book about the uh, neatening up of public space and the, uh, the uh, kind of, uh, if I may say so, infantilized projection of safe safety without uh, fear or challenge. So maybe you should talk a little bit. <laughs> well, uh, I, my job is to get all of you to, uh, to talk. And questions, by the way, have the question cards been collected? Are there any question cards? Mara? Can, can I read a couple of comments from a please, blog? Please, yes, please, yeah. This is September 4th, 2012, from Vanessa. I've wondered for many years why the word gentrification has any negative connotation at all, except to people who love to complain. Houses, buildings, towns, they all need love too. It's important to clean the outside, the inside and outside of a structure, and I don't know why that would separate the poor from the rich. Everyone at every level should keep things tidy. To me, the positive feedback is immediate. Clean means it's comfortable for me to be there and welcoming to others. I can't see complaining about that. Gentrification is a good thing. And Sandy in Texas writes, in response, if gentrification meant picking up trash, cleaning off graffiti, replacing broken windows, upgrading wiring and plumbing, setting and emptying rat traps, etc., yes, would be a good thing. In practice, what I've seen it to mean is expensive renovation slash remodeling that the original tenants can afford, which then drives up taxable property value of neighboring properties so their tenants can afford to live there, et cetera. One of the few places where what I think is your definition of gentrification has taken place and worked was a couple cities in Minnesota in the 70s. The old Victorian houses, many of them falling apart, were sold for a dollar to people who legally contracted to put in as much work as it took to bring them up to code and make them livable. These neighborhoods were rebuilt, maybe you could even say rebirthed by the people actually living there. So these are the two really very well-known polar discussions about what it means to neaten up and beautify a city for 
the delectation of a particular class. I'd like to say one other thing which had to do with something that is not hard economics at all, but with the, uh, you know, why is the creative person and the artist the uh, symbolic figure of the desirable self? And I think it's very simply the, uh, the creative, the collective imaginary mm -hmm. of the uh, knowledge worker class. They, it's like this professional managerial class dreaming of what it would be for them to actually own the tools by which they do their work, whether it's an accountant or a video game maker or whatever. Well, I, I agree with uh, I agree with your pointing to the second really important use of creativity discourse, and that is to ease the passage from industrial to post-industrial economy which Tom brought up before, um, uh, whether, whether or not the, uh, the, uh, the, the corporate uh, managerial, technical, professional group of us, uh, whether, whether we are dreaming or they are dreaming uh, of, uh, of, of possessing the, the, the tools of production, they certainly are yearning for a more authentic way of life and a more authentic self. And you could see that even in terms of um, pre-gentrification, gentrification, as early as the 1940s and mm. 1950s. So that there is a, there, I think there is a, a collective yearning for uh, history, for identity, for creativity, mm -hmm. uh, that is quite separate from the emplacement of creative arts and creative yes. work inside a finance-driven yeah. economy. And this is something else that we were talking about a few minutes ago. Are the creative arts the, the tail of the dog? And they're not even wagging the dog <laughs> in New York City. I mean, are we really talking about a finance-driven economy in the U.S., in the city, worldwide, in a hegemonic way, uh, where the, the, the dog is finance and the tail is, you know, the very wagging creative arts? You talked about what attracting the corporate sector. So you described the two models. One was the kind of, uh, well, I thought you were, uh, one is uh, tax breaks and stadiums. We have to remember yeah, yeah, stadiums. stadiums. And, even and, and do you remember, what was the other thing they used to, oh, uh, giant convention centers convention and then casinos yeah, the Renaissance in the Midwest. Center. Everybody wants to have a casino. Right. Right. I haven't noticed that those objects of construction are dying in any way. No, no. but these are all the sort of the, the failed urban right. you know, revival theories of the yeah. last 20 years. But it's, years. it's so bizarre because it's quite obviously a zero-sum game. It's like the whole point is that you're, you're stealing from somebody else exactly. to be better. Exactly. And therefore, wow. <laughs> if you can pretend there is no somebody why is that, else, why is that? Is that truer now than it was in the industrial economy? Is it? it you know what? Uh, I have the sense that in, an industrialization brought many centers of productive activity, right. but you know maybe we are seeing a concentration in fewer and fewer centers in New York, London, you know, the, the so-called... You know, ironically, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Please. One of the reasons that, uh, that, that, uh, that our government uh, is sort of has declined to crack down on the financial industry, you know, where there's obviously so much fraud and, you know, all kinds of crazy things have gone on, is because they're afraid that if they do, those guys will decamp for London. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons. So this, this competition is race to the bottom, you know. Well, I have it on good authority from Richard Florida, in fact, uh, in this uh, 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 post on the Atlantic City's website the other day, that New York has overtaken London as the world's leading financial center. Awesome. Then, th <laughs> then their financial industry will run to here. <laughs> well, now that the oligarchs probably have to move their capital uh, back to Russia to save it from seizure, mm -hmm. this could well be true. But there's always Frankfurt. So, you know, it, 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 how, how far do we have to go to talk about 
what, the crisis of funding the arts, the crisis uh, of something we haven't even mentioned yet tonight, the crisis of housing for, uh, for artists of every type in New York City. How far do we have to go? Do we have to go up to the global level? There's just a multi multiple range of flows involved here. I mean, that clearly the housing issue, I mean, the, the, the is, is really important there. That, uh, I mean, if you look, look at London, we have a major housing issue in London as a whole in terms yes. of a problem of house inflation. It's and of course, artists parks. are just at the bottom of the, uh, of the scale of, of that. So they're you know, in, in the worst possible situation. But it's part of a broader issue about, uh, about sort of uh, housing costs in, in that particular case. Okay. Okay. But so also in terms of the financial um, services, um, the, one of the sort of whole things that, that the cultural sector has been used in sort of uh, is, is, is this tag to attract this investment or to hold on to it in some way. The whole sense of investing in opera houses and concert halls and all this sort of uh, stuff in a way. That, uh, um, I mean, so you can't dissociate them. And of course, then you get this concept of causation. You have all this huge amount of investment of, uh, of city authorities in these activities. And then it draws in, uh, that's where the facilities are, etc. I think the problem here is causality. What caused what? And is this really the way that we want to carry on doing things in, in terms? Is this really helpful for culture and creative activity? Because as I say, it's, it's, it's really to, uh, the Richard Florida model as well is to, is to help the, the financial services, not to help art and culture. Exactly. And, and can I also just mention here that what a recipe for banality all of, this, this, <laughs> these, all of these, these theories are. Think about it. I mean, the, the, the art that we all, that we all you know, regard as iconic, I'm just thinking here in terms of literature and novels, and that's of thing is about life, right? It's about the way people le le you know, live their lives. Uh, average people or financiers or people that work in factories or whatever, accountants, all that sort of thing. When you flip it the way these theories demand and say, you know, no, art is to, to, <laughs> to uh, you know, we, we have to do a, a nice show to draw those people, you know, to our city so that we, uh, so, so that we, can, we can survive. It's, it's, it's this complete inversion in which we just, again, spectacularization. We just do this performance. We pretend to be artists and you know, we, we uh, you know, have to create a scene and have to hang around and, uh, you know, and, and look spectacular and do silly things. And well, the experience economy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the experience there you economy. Go. Exactly, exactly. But it's uh, what awful art it will produce. Just think about that. So uh, as consumers, we're also and producers, and right? And the, the ultimate. Uh, Say, so let me ask uh, uh, some questions that emerge from the long-suffering audience. Uh, do artists have a role in imagining a world outside of capitalism? How? How can they imagine a world outside of capitalism? Martha, you've been imagining a world <laughs> well, outside of capitalism. You know, ever since uh, post-structuralism, we have to affir affirm that there is no outside. So that's the first thing. There you go. Second thing is it's not an accident that a very large proportion of Occupy Wall Street was made up of and continues to be made up of artists because, of course, the power of the imagination constantly is refusing to accept the limitations that everyday life suggests are the boundaries of human possibility. I'm being both vague and a cheerleader, but I think it's really important that we do hang on to that romantic idea that what art can do is posit a better world and to get to work thinking about how it does that. That was my little cheerleading speech. Well, and, and, and that well deserves the next question, which asks for specifics. <laughs> how, oh, no. how, how can everyday New Yorkers build sustainable arts culture? How can ev uh, everyday New Yorkers fight the corporate financialized arts culture? What can people do specifically? Any ideas? There's that ad slogan, just do it. Yeah. Is a reason why they captured such a slogan. But I think that's, yeah. that's, that's been where uh, sort of uh, civil activity and in, uh, in, uh, uh, civil society, what people do is often about instantiating, doing those things. I mean, that's what artists, uh, particularly community artists, often do. 
Here, <laughs> well. You know, all those ad people went to art school. That's yeah. right, they're all art, artists monkey. This is the famous yeah, of thing. of course. Yeah, they want to be novelists and That's they right. wind up writing copy for, right. you know. Well, I have now. often thought <laughs> that uh, advertising creatives are uh, the true public intellectuals. But then they wind up creating uh, those uh, marvelous vignettes of, um, of everyday life, highly, highly um, fantasized everyday life, like the Levi's campaign that was filmed in Braddock, Pennsylvania, Braddock. declining oh, steel town. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, the, uh, again, but that's a really interesting. I've I done uh, uh, some studies of, of, uh, of advertising agencies and advertising uh, workers, and uh, often many of the things is that they have second jobs or they have subsidiary activities doing fine art. Yeah, you know, because they don't want to give it up. And also, you know, I think you find this across a lot of the spectrum of the activities we've been talking about. They're not an either or. They're a codependency. People require the tension between them often to actually produce good things on, on either side. It's a, it's, a, it's a conversation, sometimes a very one-sided conversation. But actually, you know, I guess ideally, one would like there to be more of the conversation so that people are actually engaged in the challenging stuff rather than producing the banalities. Because that's what you get otherwise if you just programmatize it. You just get the banalities. So it's just, uh, well, part of the problem. And, and to that point and to answer that question very directly, seek fringe. You know, as much as we are attracted to mainstream culture, and I love mainstream culture, Seek out the fringe and support artists who are on the edge, who are underdiscovered artists, and, and support them because that's going to be the best way to sort of fight the mainstream. Mm. Okay, go to, go to that modern dance performance and go to that off off. Go to Bushwick. <laughs> I dare well, you. Well, that brings up, that brings up a, a word that has not been mentioned yet tonight rent. Uh, how, how is it possible? Rent. To survive, not rent the yeah. theater piece. Yeah. <laughs> how, how is it possible to uh, to hold those two jobs, right, and to to make your art? Somehow, Andy, when you were speaking, I had these two very different images in my mind. You know, the Marx's socialist utopia, where you play your violin in the afternoon after you put in your day in the fields. Um, but I, I think that people are holding those two jobs because they are trying to pay the rent. So, what can we do? We used to say when, in, uh, so for years I put out a literary magazine in the uh, south side of Chicago before, uh, it, before we elected our state senator president and, and, <laughs> and succeeded in gentrifying the whole place. Um, and we used to say uh, that this, this, the, you know, the secret to happiness is low overhead. And it, it kind of was in that place. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I went to thrift stores all the time. Mm -hmm. Thrift store literature, thrift store clothes. Everything I'm wearing is from the thrift store. I think I paid good money for this, this, the tie. Shoes. Everything else, no, you're right, I did buy the shoes. That's right. But everything else is from the thrift, everything else I thrifted. And uh, that's how we lived. And, it, it, you know, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Okay, and, so that... Know, but I wasn't in New York, was I? And I wasn't in uh, Wicker Park, and I wasn't in... You know, the, the beautiful North, North Shore, I was in South Side. So is it too expensive to be an artist in New York? You don't know. I you don't, don't live, live here. here. <laughs> okay, well, what do the rest of us well, think? Certainly, you don't a, live here certainly, certainly a lot yes. of people have said, have said that, you know, and, and, and it seems fairly logical to, to see that as well. I mean, I think that's why I was making that point earlier about, uh, about space, is that there, there, what you have to do is just do it, is to organize yourself to actually find other alternative spaces, other ways, other, other models of managing space or of finding alternative forms of, uh, of generating economic income. I'm using thrift stores and that is, is using an informal gift economy in some ways and is another way of, of uh, being able to work on the fringes of through and outside this system. But I mean, I think there are lots of examples of artists because they want to survive and carry on doing what they're doing. There is no other way aside from actually you have to take control of the space. You either squat the space or that you engage in a way that you get some collective ownership of it so you can control it. That's the key point. You can control it and therefore be able to do with, with it in terms of the activities that you're doing, which are otherwise denied to you, that you have to do them under somebody else's terms. 
Well, and not spend all your creativity trying to figure out how to survive, right? <laughs> good, good idea. Um, let me take the last minute to try to summarize a few uh, of the other audience questions. Uh, and, and to bring up a solution that nobody has, has suggested, and that is to get more government funding. Have, have, have we dried up? Which government did you have? Well, have, we, have, we, have we completely dried up the, um, uh, the source? Is there, is there nothing there? Come on. Yes, you got there's the, nothing there. No, I live in Washington. There's, there's the House, nothing is going through the, the Republican mm -hmm. Congress, nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I mean, the, the, this is why, by the way, people are drawn to the, the Florida theory, because it seems like a practical way to support mm -hmm. funding for the arts, mm -hmm. um, you know? And, uh, and that's, that's fine for them, but as, as, you know, that's obviously as a journalist, I can't, you know, that's not good enough. That's not, mm -hmm. the, um, but yeah, that's, the, I'm sorry, that's just the way it is, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll shut up now. But I wonder if it's a question of do we need more subsidy or do we, it's, you talked about overconsumption earlier and I think that's a bigger piece is we're noticing just economically we're shrinking the, the, the way we operate. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's part of it too is we just have to figure out there's a new model of how to, we have to figure out what the new model is for how to survive as an individual or to survive as a cultural institution. Can I remind you why, why the, the, you know, the great WPA, you know, art support mm. project supported mm. uh, authors as well as visual artists and they had plays, you know, the famous play pro, I forget what it was called. But they, uh, why did they do all that? You remember what the reason was? Because artists were unemployed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was it. Mm -hmm. That was the justification. And are artists not unemployed Oh, now? they're massively un unemployed, but you don't have Franklin Roosevelt anymore, I'm sorry to say. But we also don't have 25% unemployment. That's right. Which is... Well, this is a terribly distressing note on which to, uh, to end the evening. <laughs> yeah, we need optimism. Well, optimism. I, uh, um, I'm not sure I can, I can rediscover the strands of optimism except in, in, in the, uh, uh, the urging to go out and do it, take, take a building, take, you know, organize, <laughs> uh, uh, get a second job. Go to Detroit. Move to Kansas City. Yeah, there Come you on. go. Okay. <laughs> uh, they're, fun they're, they're funding the arts. Move. move. <laughs> There's a guy with right his hand there. up. He's pointing there. Who's, who has the question? Right in the it's second row. Right here. Yes, what is the question? My question is, so I'm a part of a collective of artists that actually lost our spaces back in October. And everyone always speaks about philanthropists. How do we meet them? How do we, we, we want Oh my God, they've, they've got to be here. They've got to be here. That's, that's why artists are relying on Pitch Engine and Indiegogo and Kickstarter, all of which are horrible, but horrible compared to what? Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know, called crowdfunding um, because at least it's within, and it depends on Facebook and Twitter, but at least it's within a community of sympathy because the more challenging you are, the less likely you're going to get a philanthropic backer. So it's socialism for the poor and philanthropy well, yeah, yeah. for the rich. There's nothing okay. new there. That's the other way around. Oh, right. sorry. That's philanthropy right. for the poor and socialism for the rich. OK, yes, uh, probably. Right. Well, maybe that's an optimistic note on, on I'm in socialism. socialism. Thank you very much, and thank you thank to you. the panelists. Thanks.